Um, and so thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. So uh, this week or this month, we're doing uh, something a little bit different. So we have a you know, sort of one presenter with a, a, an extended amount of time. Uh, so our speaker is Richard Mole uh, from Ansto. Uh, he's going to talk about inelastic neutron scattering as a tool for investigating organic semiconductors. Um, so Richard, uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Bronson. Uh, and yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction and, and the invite to come and talk to you today. Um, and I think this was set in motion by Andy, so I should thank him as well. It's been really quite interesting for me to do this uh, uh, seminar because what I'm going to talk about is not work that I've actually done myself, but work that's been done internationally on uh, organic conductors uh, with uh, inelastic neutron scattering and show what tools we have available in Australia. And uh, that's basically my main aim of the talk is basically introduce the concept of inelastic scattering. It's not something that the uh, AU Chaos community is currently using extensively. Um, so I'd like to let you know what instrumentation we have, how it compares with the rest of the world, and hopefully demonstrate um, that our capabilities are of use uh, to your research community. So uh, as I said, this isn't going to be work that of my own that I'm presenting, which is a bit unusual when you're giving a seminar. Uh, so I normally put my acknowledgements at the start. So I've just ripped up the ripped off the biographies of these two people who I'll talk about. Now, Hamish Covey, or his work I'll talk about, I think some people will know after he did his PhD at uh, UQ in the organic electronic area. He is now at ISIS as an instrument scientist on one of the spectrometers there. And uh, Anne Joubert, <coughs> excuse me, uh, whose work I'll also talk about most, uh, most of all, actually. Um, she's at Imperial College London, and um, she does a lot of work in this field in uh, using neutron scattering to understand dynamics of organic electronics. And these are basically the two papers that I used extensively while preparing this um, uh, seminar. You know, on the right, we've got Hamish's little mini review on is it an underutilized tool for organic electronics research? Um, I read his paper and I agree with him that there's lots that we can do, uh, which is sort of the sort of catalyst for Andy asking me to give this uh, seminar. I think we're uh, asking Bronson to let me give this seminar. Uh, well, on the left, this paper by Anne that came out in uh, Chemistry of Materials uh, about two years ago now. Um, this is a sort of tour de force um, using many different spectrometers on one classic sample, or I believe classic sample, um, uh, of an organic uh, conjugated polymer. Uh, that is used extensively in the field. Um, so I think the place where I should start this is, why do I think inelastic neutron scattering will be useful? Um, you know, what's the point? And basically, the premise of this is that the time scale of the charge transfer processes that you require in an organic semiconductor are on the sort of femto to picosecond time scale, uh, whereas charge transport through the polymers occurs faster on the order of tens or hundreds of picoseconds. So that's what I assume about these materials. I should say I'm an inorganic chemist, not an organic chemist, and I look at magnetism, not uh, electronics. So uh, I might be wrong. Um, I believe that sort of the, the majority of materials in this field are conjugated polymers. These are soft materials, and they have dynamics in exactly the same range that uh, uh, time range that we're talking about. They have vibrations and different motions on these different uh, time scales. And the reason why I think this is uh, going to be important uh, and why we should maybe use these techniques, inelastic neutron scattering techniques, is that the structural dynamics that you can observe with inelastic neutron scattering are related to the function of these materials. So why inelastic neutron scattering? And I'm just going to put this in context of some other techniques here. And um, this is a classic slide that you'll see every time you go to a neutron school. Um, and that is that... Uh, um, it shows the energy range that uh, uh, neutron scattering spectrometers span. And you will see that it overlaps very largely with things like Raman scattering, NMR, tools that you uh, will use extensively. But one of the really key points about uh, uh, INS over pretty much any other technique is because we're scattering particles which have mass, um, we get momentum transfer. So we don't just span the energy space, we also span Q, we also span reciprocal space. So we can get spatial information about our excitations as well as energy dependent information. And that's hugely powerful. Um, 
So that's sort of the main uh, take on these. We cover the same energy range as many other techniques uh, do, but the big, uh, the big, the ultimate power is that we get this Q dependence. We get this structural or spatial information about excitations. So ANSTO has four spectrometers uh, in its suite, two triple axis spectrometers and two time of flight spectrometers, one of which is very complicated called the backscattering spectrometer. And one of the triple axis has a different back end we call the brilliant filter. Today, I'd like to go through um, three of those, the time of flight spectrometers and the brilliant filter, because I think they are most relevant to the work that you may want to do uh, with your sort of materials. Um, if you think you might be interested in triple axis, I'm always happy to talk about it. Um, and uh, uh, so they're the ones I want to describe. Uh, and this is where they are at the uh, facility. I think it's kind of important here that you'll see that SICA and Taipan, our two triple axis wire, brilliant filter spectrometer, sit right at the reactor face. This is a fundamental uh, issue with uh, inelastic neutron scattering is that what we're often looking at is very weak effects. Um, what we consider signal, um, you know, diffraction people consider noise. And um, uh, to get, uh, get around that, we always want to deal with the highest fluxes of neutrons possible. So we often put our instruments right at the reactor face or close to the uh, uh, reactor on shorter guide positions. So many of you, I believe, will use platypus or the uh, for reflectometry or the two sands instruments. Um, uh, they're much further downstream, whereas we need the, uh, uh, we're close to the re reactor because we need the higher neutron fluxes. Um, also, the thing uh, worth pointing out is that three of our spectrometers are on the cold guide, uh, and only one of them is on the, uh, looking at the thermal source. For, uh, obviously, for structural work, um, for suns, etc., the cold guide is used because it's proportional to the lens scale of the system you're looking at. With us, it's all about energy scale. And Pelican and Enio are low energy spectrometers, and Taipan is a thermal spectrometer, so it's a higher energy, uh, higher energy instrument. So these are the major things that uh, INS can be used to measure. And this covers all of science. Um, uh, I have a very varied user group that uh, uh, comes to Pelican, which is the instrument that I uh, spend most of my time on. And uh, we look at things from self-diffusion of water in clays, uh, rotational diffusion in clath rates, phonons in thermoelectrics, and magnetic excitations in all sorts of exotic materials. But uh, the thing that I think is going to be most interesting to the organic electronics community uh, is the measurement of phonons and of self-diffusion. The other key thing that uh, I should point out is we're not restricted with our samples. That uh, uh, We do uh, measure things that are both solids, liquid, gas, crist uh, glasses, crystallized. We can't do gases. Um, so uh, there's no restrictions in terms of it has to be highly crystalline or it even has to be single crystalline. We can look at um, liquids and gooey messes. So um, we can be used to measure dynamics in a wide variety of materials. So what sort of dynamics, I keep mentioning this word, what can we look at? And this is sort of a stylized um, uh, spectrum that covers a, a huge energy range. And what we see is uh, we see the elastic peak, which contains structural information. Uh, the first um, uh, thing that we sometimes look at is the quasi-elastic peak. Uh, so broadening of the elastic line, this is due to diffusion or relaxations of the uh, uh, sample. Uh, so um, uh, this can this is very useful, for example, for looking at dopant movement throughout uh, a material or water moving in a clay. Then we have low energy vibrations, uh, such as phonons, high energy vibrations, and then up at the um, mega electron volt um, energy range, we see uh, um, uh, electronic effects, uh, but we don't have any instrumentation that can study those. So I will not mention those again. Um, in terms of the uh, organic electronics uh, community, this is why I think it's going to be uh, interesting in that the, vi the high energy vibrations uh, have been known to impact absorption and charge transfers is why I, my original premise that these sort of dynamics affect the uh, functionality of materials. The low energy modes are things like the backbone torsion or uh, side chain motion. And uh, these have been shown previously um, uh, to affect the efficiency of optoelectronic processes. And also many of them uh, that have been studied in the past have been shown to have diffusive and rotational dynamics, uh, which may or may not uh, affect the performance of these materials. 
before we go on too far, and uh, what I thought would be a good idea to do is just give you a rough overview of uh, what the spectrometer looks like and what we're actually measuring. So this is the Pelican spectrometer. This is where I spend my uh, time doing measurements. It's on the cold source CG1 at, uh, at the ACNS. And basically what we're doing, looking at here is the neutrons coming down the neutron guide here. We're looking down the guide at our monochromator. We get a polychromatic beam of um, uh, neutrons from our uh, monochromator and use that to monochromate the beam. Again, because we uh, are looking at very weak signals a lot of the time, we actually have a triple monochromator. This isn't like a diffractometer where you'd have one very well defined crystal. We have three very large crystals taking three slightly different wavelengths out just to ensure we get the highest possible flux of neutrons. We then pulse our beam with a Fermi chopper or two of them. So this means that by the time we get to our sample, uh, we have a monochromatic beam with a well-known uh, time structure. And the pulses also get rid of lambda 2 from the beam. And it also ensures our background, the first chopper ensures our background is as low as possible by killing as many neutrons as possible. Now this might sound counterintuitive, but I've mentioned a couple of times already that um, uh, we want as high a flux as possible and um, that we then get rid of 99% of them by pulsing our beam. But this is it, the only way we can do this and have a, uh, um, a, a time of flight instrument, because basically the, uh, the sample can then scatter. And whatever the sample is, you know, neutrons can transfer energy to the sample or the sample can transfer energy to the neutron. They speed up and slow down. And we have a very large detector, 2.4 meters away, that's one meter high. Um, that, uh, uh, and we use the simplest piece of physics possible, which is speed equals distance over time to determine the change in energy of the neutron. We can only do that because we have this pulsed neutron structure. Uh, this is in comparison with the triple axis spectrometer where we can uh, uh, have a continuous flux of neutrons. However, we only have one detector. So getting rid of 99% of the neutrons here allows us to use this massive detector to span a huge range of Q and omega space simultaneously. Just quickly looking at that on a time distance diagram, basically what happens is we have some neutrons hit the sample. Uh, and then the, if the sample is warm, if it's got some thermal energy, uh, you can take the sample from an excited state to the ground state and that will, the neutron will then speed up and go faster. Um, on Pelican, that means we can actually transfer up to 1,000 MeV of energy to a neutron. Um, uh, so you, you have to have a very warm sample to uh, do this. Uh, next is the elastic line. These are the neutrons that hit the sample and just change direction. The classic for there is powder diffraction, where the elastic line contains the structural information. Or we have the neutrons which hit the sample, the sample's in the ground state and is excited to a, a excited state, the neutron slows down and finally turns up at the detector. So that's the process that's occurring uh, and that's roughly how we measure it. So I want to flip back now to this uh, uh, paper I was talking about with uh, uh, that uh, Anne Gilbert uh, uh, published a couple of years back on uh, P3HT, which I believe is a sort of very standard conjugated polymer used in this research field. And this paper really is a tour de force because it doesn't just look at the dynamics on one time scale, it uses three or four different spectrometers to cover a wide range of time and uh, spatial scale and show that you get useful information on each of these different time and spatial scales. So this would be transferable, I'm sure, to many of your materials, which might be more complicated. Um, uh, but this is just a good standard sample, so I thought it'd be a good one to talk about. Um, I think it's uh, of note that she can change the site or she changes the side chain length to get regio random and regio regular samples, uh, i.e. she can change the amount of crystallinity in this sample. With the aim of understanding further how this affects structure and how uh, the structure is affected by the dynamics of these materials by changing the side length change. So this is uh, the um, uh, figure she had in her paper. It's actually quite nice because it's that same plot of time and Q that we had before, uh, but there she's basically put which instrument she's used at the uh, ILL, which is IN16, B, IN6 and IN1 Lagrange. And I'm just highlighting that all of these measurements we can do, they're pretty much one-to-one -one comparisons of our EMU, Pelican, and Taipan Brilliant filter spectrometer. 
But I think what's, uh, and this is a typical data set that you would get off Pelican. And uh, down the bottom you see here, you've got the quasi-elastic peak and the vibrational spectra. So the broadening of the elastic line gives this quasi-elastic peak and the uh, vibrational spectra is this portion of the spectra here. Just to highlight those, because you also have this nice graphic in there which shows that what we're looking at with uh, quasi-elastic scattering is one of uh, several things. One is you can look at small molecule diffusion. Um, secondly, you can look at things like rotational dynamics. So she's highlighted a methyl group there. Obviously, methyl groups spin uh, and C3 axis. And this gives you a quasi-elastic peak. This is a self-correlation, uh, uh, sort of localized diffusion, and this gives you uh, quasi-elastic broadening. Similarly, you might see slower motions of a sort of torsion or a twisting uh, of the polymer backbone. And again, this information is encoded into the broadening of the elastic line. Looking at to higher energies of the same portion of the same spectrum, what she's looking at really there is the vibration. So you've got the phonons. Now, phonons are always spoken about in terms of crystalline lattice, uh, which for a polymer is a bit of a push, but these longer range uh, um, uh, motions where you've got correlations between different molecules, but equally vibrations within um, uh, one molecule. Now, these are of the sort of femtosecond time scale, and these are of a sort of picosecond time scale. I think we should probably have a little bit of a chat about hydrogen and sample size. So hydrogen is sort of the bane of many neutron scatterers' life um, because you get this large incoherent scattering coming from the nuclear spin of hydrogen. Um, and it makes many neutron scattering experiments challenging because to do, say, a diffraction experiment, uh, uh, you would often be advised to deuterate your material. Now, obviously, we're in a really lucky position here in Australia. The, the ANSTO, we've got the uh, NDF. And I believe they've worked a lot with the, your research community to provide deuterated materials. But QUENS is a bit different, or lots of inelastic scattering of polymers is a bit different. And then we're looking at incoherent phenomena. We're looking at self-correlations. We're looking at things like diffusion. What happens to one particle over a function of time? We're not looking at structure, where you're looking at pair correlations. And the second thing uh, uh, that's an advantage of this is we don't, so we don't back away from using hydrogen a lot of the time. It's actually where our strongest signal comes from. And because hydrogen has a very large scattering cross-section from about 80 barn from memory, whereas most elements are of the order of one to 10, um, you don't need a huge sample. Now this I mentioned because I think there's sort of a historical view that for inelastic scattering, you're only looking at single crystal materials and you need 10 gram uh, large single crystals. And um, for certain experiments, I, I wouldn't back away if you gave me a, a 10 gram single crystal. However, for things like polymers, this just isn't true, that we'd end up with a horrible, messy multiple scattering signal. And a lot of the time, we need a much smaller sample, typically of the order of half a gram. Now, I guess that for many of you, if there's any synthetic chemists there, that's still a very large scale synthesis compared to uh, what you do for many other techniques, including neutron reflectivity. Um, but it isn't the sort of multiple gram uh, uh, preparation scale that you might need. Um, after saying that we don't need to deuterate, it is also something that is really useful in the sort of armory of uh, inelastic neutron scattering. So where you might use it in SANS for contrast matching, we can do similar things. We can switch modes on and off. Um, but also there's this idea of that we can control whether we're seeing coherent or incoherent scattering because deuterium has mainly coherent, mainly coherent uh, scattering cross-section and hydrogen, a mainly incoherent scattering cross-section, you can tune both. And I think it's worth thinking about that, that coherent scattering is pair correlations. So the classic is in elastic scattering is diffraction. They all come from the coherent scattering from long range pair correlations. And in uh, the inelastic uh, equivalent is phonons in a crystalline lattice where you get this Q dependent uh, information uh, related to both the excitation and the structure. Whereas for uh, uh, incoherent scattering, you're looking at self colorations. If you have a, a particle at, at, in position t, uh, R at time zero, where is it after time T? So this is related to self diffusion. So if you have a molecule moving through your lattice or through your polymer, you could see how fast and how far it's moving because uh, you still get that Q dependent information. Uh, at the elastic line, it's simply just proportional to the number of atoms in your material. But you can also get uh, localized modes in your phonon density of states and uh, as, as well as some information about the general phonons in there. 
So that paper that uh, I'm talking about in chemistry materials uh, uh, uses both hydrogenous and deuterated material. So in some ways it's a special case that it looks at both of them. Um, but it also shows you what information you can get from having just hydrogen and having just deuterium. The starting point pretty much of uh, any inelastic neutron scattering experiment though is, is structure. Uh, that if you want to know how your atoms are moving in a molecule or in a material, uh, you sort of basically need to know roughly where they are in the first instance. Um, and this chemistry materials paper does this with neutron diffraction. Um, now, I admit this might not be the best technique for uh, many polymers and many soft matter materials, um, but you know, you'll need to have a thorough NMR analysis or a thorough uh, um, structure determination of some sort before you start. But I did include this in this talk uh, and took these slides out of the um, uh, paper because what you can see clearly here is the black data is the deuterated polymer and the uh, green and the blue ones are the uh, hydrogenous ones. So you can just see how much more structural information you get from the pair correlation deuterated material than you do from the hydrogenous one. Similarly, they used a regio random and a regio regular sample, and the random one obviously has a lot, a lot fewer crystalline peaks in there, as you would expect. Um, so that's just a take home that we do need to know some structural information before we start. I don't expect that's always going to be diffraction. In some of the other polymer work that we've done on uh, Pelican, this has yeah, typically been uh, NMR work. So this is a Quen spectrum, and this is what we uh, uh, typically are analyzing in uh, it. What we see in green here is the uh, resolution function of the instrument, which we determine either using vanadium or a very cold sample. And the uh, uh, different colored um, uh, uh, points in this are the, the deuterated or the hydrogenous sample or the region random or the regio regular samples. We do the same for the hydrogenous one and the deuterated one. And also it's of note that these signals change as a function of Q. So as we move across our detector, we get broader and broader, broader um, uh, peaks. Now, I don't want to go too much into the details of data analysis for this. Um, yeah, there's fitting of uh, uh, varying uh, uh, types that has to take place. In this case, I actually did some uh, stretched exponentials after fully transforming this data into the time domain. But the key point is this is what we're seeing. And I think what's really important for this sample is what does it tell you about the material? So firstly, when they looked at the hydrogenous sample, which just has the incoherent motions, the two samples of different crystallinity had very, very similar um, uh, uh, scattering. So you see the red and the black line here sit on top of each other. So this is telling you that the localized self motions of this polymer, so this might be the methyl group rotations, it might be twisting of the uh, uh, molecule itself or the polymer itself, is very similar, irrespective of the crystallinity of the lattice. But you still see the same dynamics, which is, sort of, I guess, if you're designing a new material for a device, this is important because if you have to have crystalline material, it's harder to get than uh, having a completely amorphous material. So this is saying that those motions on a picosecond are the same, irrespective of whether it's uh, uh, crystalline or not. And then went on to uh, uh, look at the deuterated material, and there you actually see a difference between the uh, uh, regio regular and regio random. Now, this perhaps is not too much of a surprise that if you have some pair correlations that are stronger because you have some crystalline order in there, that you would see a, a different, uh, uh, you see dynamics on a different, uh, that are different between the ordered and the slightly disordered material. But this then highlights the uh, power of neutron scattering, as I keep mentioning, that we're measuring on Q scale as well as on an energy scale. And what we can do is we can look at the difference in the uh, um, Quen spectrum as a function of Q, and we can relate the length scale of the changes in dynamics to back to the structure. So in this case, the collective dynamics, i.e. the ones between molecules, um, seem to be uh, related to the uh, uh, motions in the lamina, lamellar direction and in the, uh, um, what was the other one? I can't remember which other direction, uh, the pi pi uh, uh, direction. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want to move on from uh, uh, quasi elastic neutron scattering at this point. Uh, as I say I've just uh, shown roughly that it's uh, 
uh, gives you information about sort of local motions, self diffusion and rotations, the uh, which are picosecond motions. Um, on faster time scales, the femtosecond time scales, which uh, uh, are also of interest, we're looking at true molecular vibrations, and these can be correlated vibrations throughout the lattice. Uh, neutron spectroscopy has got a heap of advantages um, in this case. Um, firstly, uh, is we're looking at hard sphere scattering. There's nothing. It's, we're not scattering light, so there's no quantum mechanics involved in this. We're just billiard balls hitting billiard balls on springs. Um, so there's no selection rules. So it's not like Raman, where the quantum mechanical nature of light basically means that you end up with uh, selection rules for your vibrational analysis. So this is both a blessing and a curse. So it means that you're always going to see the vibration that you want because we see all vibrations. However, we see all vibrations, so sometimes your spectra can look like a dog's breakfast because every mode sits on top of each other. The second thing is, again, that it's, not, uh, it's a Q-dependent measurement. So Raman probes Q equals zero. Uh, so you get beautiful optic modes if you have uh, true uh, optic modes in your material. But if you've got acoustic modes due to motions of correlated between uh, uh, molecules, uh, you can't probe those with uh, Raman. You can with inelastic neutron scattering. And again, we can use uh, things like contrast variation to silence varying modes and to uh, uh, enhance others. One that's sort of a real, uh, this comes from the review of uh, Hamish Gavay, um, is we don't see photoluminescence. So obviously with Raman or uh, IR me uh, methods, you irradiate your sample with light, and this can uh, uh, excite, um, that you can get photoluminescence in your material, which causes a change in structure, which causes different modes. So uh, going back to the sample uh, that Andrew Bear reported in the Raman spectra, uh, there's supposedly a peak at about uh, uh, 14,600, which will be about here, I believe. And this is just not present in the inelastic neutron scattering. So this is down to uh, exciting a pi pi uh, interaction. The neutron scattering actually goes one step further in that uh, we're very powerful with sample environment. We can uh, change temperature, change magnetic field, everything with your, uh, your sample, because we can build sample environments out of uh, uh, aluminum. We can also irradiate your sample with light while measuring the inelastic spectrum. So one thing you could do is you could irradiate a photoactive polymer with light and see how the vibrational spectra change with, uh, with and without light irradiation. And this is something we've actually done on Pelican with photopolymerization. We put a bunch of monomers in a uh, sample can, irradiated it with the correct wavelength of light, and watched how the dynamics changed, how the self diffusion changed as we uh, polymerize the material. So, vibrational spectra has a lot of advantages. Um, and as I say, for that sample of that P3HP, um, uh, the lack of some modes in the RAM and showed that there was photoluminescence in there. So, we're looking at pure vibrational spectrum, that's one key advantage. Um, I should mention some of the other spectrometers um, as I go on. So the Taipan Brilliant Filter is a really simple uh, instrument. All we have is a very large monochromator in a drum that's buried under this pile of concrete here. And um, this uh, monochromator, basically, you move the whole instrument around the monochromator drum to vary the instant wavelength or the instant energy. The samples are then scattered by the sample, which is held here, into a large detector bank. And instead of having a time of flight detector like Pelican, we use a continuous beam, but we use a selection of different filter materials to ensure that we only get neutrons that are under 5 MeV coming off the sample and on, into the detector. So this is very similar to the uh, Iron 1 Lagrange instrument at ILL, which is used in a couple of these uh, papers that I've mentioned. Um, and it's available here and can do pretty much exactly the same thing. Um, one of the benefits that we should also discuss is the power, and this basically caused a renaissance of the INS, I think, in the 2000s, the power of computation uh, to understand our spectra. And that basically, if you do a molecular dynamics simulation, uh, you're looking at how particles move in a box as a function of time and space. If you Fourier transform that from to reciprocal space and energy, you get an INS spectrum. Similarly, DFT, um, it's very straightforward to uh, get the Hermitian, the matrix of second derivatives that's proportional to the forces between all the atoms. Uh, and that's, that's what gives you the phonon spectrum. So the advent of high-powered computing and easily accessible uh, uh, 
uh, codes for both DNT and TFT and MD um, means that we can use advanced computational methods to verify and understand our data. I'll get onto that in a second. Uh, the other thing that's really important is, and I mentioned this before, that we're looking at hard spheres hitting hard spheres. There's nothing complicated about neutron scattering. It's nucle you know, neutrons hitting nuclei. Um, as such, there's no dependence on the polarizability of the light. There's no quantum mechanical terms in there. So it's very easy to calculate a spectra. And this is one of the examples from uh, Hamish's uh, Angavanta mini review that uh, uh, he uh, included. And this is uh, this lady, Olga Kruglova, was uh, uh, using INS to look at uh, the vibrational properties of this material simply to so this uh, conjugated. Uh, ring system. Um, she was looking at electron phonon coupling, or she wanted to understand electron phonon coupling because this causes unwanted electronic relaxation uh, in potential solar cell material. So she was looking at this as a model compound to try and understand the phonon component of the electron phonon coupling. Now I'll just point out here that uh, she did look at a partially deuterated material. Uh, and that's because these uh, methyl groups would spin around at room temperature and would give you a very broad quasi-elastic uh, signal, which would contaminate the rest of the signal. So this was selectively deuterated, again, showing the power of deuteration in this technique. And it's just the rest of the uh, protons in this material that were re giving rise to this signal. And what we have at the top is the signal from Tosca. And underneath, we have the uh, calculation done using DFT. Uh, then. Just to emphasize DFT calculation in this case, there's no refinable parameters. There's no, uh, all you input into your calculation is the atomic coordinates. Um, so this was probably done on a crystalline uh, uh, code, but it might have been done on a molecular one. So it's atomic coordinates and the potentials that you want to use, the pseudo potentials that you want to use. There's no refinable parameters. So although you know, it's, my eye is almost immediately drawn to the fact that there is this offset between this uh, calculation and the uh, data, the spectra is in general very well reproduced as a slight compression of the energy scale. So we can reproduce the spectra uh, with DFT uh, very well. And that's the real advantage here, the DFT, the calculation then holds far, far more information than the spectra itself does. And from the spectra, we can assign modes, we can determine what is actually happening in your molecule, what is happening in your material. Finally, I just want to go on to our final sort of uh, instrument. I'm going to run short of time, so I don't want to go off too long. This is our most complicated instrument. Um, just to go through, so we, we monochromate the beam, we then uh, reflect the bit, part of the beam, we pulse it and reflect part of it back onto a Doppler drive here, which shifts it like a Doppler drive does. It shifts the energy. It's like a big must power spectrometer or something. Uh, we have a monochromator here on a Doppler drive that shifts the energy uh, of the neutrons, scatters by the sample, and then we have the analyzers in a backscattering configuration. Now, because it's in backscattering, it means we get incredibly good resolution. We get one microwave resolution. So this is perfect for lots of polymer work because we're going to look at very, very slow motions, picosecond motions. Um, and that's mainly what it's used for. So if you look at the chemistry materials paper I've spoken a lot about, the slowest motions that they look at are measured on the IN16 backscattering spectrometer. What I actually wanted to talk about uh, in this case is one of the other slightly simpler measurements that we can do uh, on a uh, backscattering spectrometer. Uh, and that's what's called an elastic fixed window scan. So here what we do is instead of uh, running the Doppler drive, we stop the Doppler and we just look at the elastic line and we change the temperature. This tells us effectively what fraction of the sample is static at any uh, given time as a function of Q. So at very low temperature, all of the atoms are pretty much static uh, and uh, everything's uh, normalized to a, a one here. As you heat up, some motions will start in the material and uh, uh, we see a reduction in intensity. We can then look at uh, what does this mean? We can look at very different regions. So this was, again, an example using the same P3HT um, polymer that I was talking about before, but this time there's a uh, modified TCNQ um, uh, molecule added in there as a dopant. So in this macromolecules paper, they're looking at both the diffusion of varying components of the dopant, but also they're looking at 
uh, as we change the temperature, what are the dynamics? At what temperature do varying motions of this system, this uh, uh, copolymer, what, what temperature do they start to activate? And this allows you to do two things. One is it, you can work out what the energy of act it can determine activation energy. But secondly, you can then determine regions of interest for when, say, I don't know, the methyl group is spinning, but the polymer chain is not it is not diffusing, it's not moving around. So these elastic fixed window scans are really important because it allows us to understand the thermal response of a polymer very simply. All we're looking at is the mean square displacement. And that comes again from just simply from the fact we measure the elastic line as a function of Q and temperature. It gives you structural information and it allows you to understand at what temperature the specific motion has onset. Right. Um, I say not really acknowledgements in this because the work is all other people's, but we do have a great inelastic neutron scattering team uh, here at ACNS. There's eight of us across the four instruments. Um, we're always very interested in here suggestions for measurements and uh, try and figure out if we can help you out, understand your materials and learn more about your materials. So these are the uh, uh, Gurchu, Alice, Kiralee, Nicola, Anton, Shin, and Dae Hong, uh, and myself are the inelastic team, and we'll be more than happy to hear from you um, about potential experiments, or if you want to learn more about the technique. I'm always happy to discuss uh, experiments. You can get uh, in touch with me here. I can either Skype you or uh, uh, reply via email. As with all neutron scattering beam time, it's done via the uh, regular proposal and peer review and proposal system. The next deadline is the 15th of September, the one after that's the 15th of March. Um, if you're all interested in uh, putting in a proposal, yeah, please do get in touch. As I say I found it really interesting to learn about uh, uh, some of these organic electronic materials. Um, yeah, and hopefully we can help you out with your research in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, very interesting presentation and I guess a lot of uh, opportunities there. So I'd like to open up for questions from the audience. So please uh, unmute your microphone and, and you can just dive in and, and ask any questions that you might have. Hi, Hi Richard. Can I just, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, I'm Richard on a big Lance. call, but um, I can't. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, you go. I thought it was my big chance to get in first once. Age before something, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> a quick question, uh, Richard. You mentioned that sample size has to be half a, um, half, you know, sort of half a gram or so. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean it has to be sort of a, a chunk of material, which is half a gram, that sits inside the beam, or is it, um, or or can it be sort of a thin film, which is hundred nanometers thick, but over, you know, sort of five meters? Or, you know, I guess the reason why I'm asking this sort of question is because the structure of a material can be different in the bulk um, compared to a thin film. And the orientation that you have in the bulk can be different to the orientation in a thin film as well. And so from a personal perspective, I'd be interested in thin film measurements, yep. um, less so bulk measurements. Okay, so that would be, a, uh, if we can get enough material in the beam, we should be able to do that. So if you could put it on a substrate and have multiple layers, I don't know what you want to use as a substrate. Um, yeah, we're limited by our beam dimensions, which can be as high as 60 millimeters high, 40 or 50 millimeters across. Um, if you can get your substrates, I don't know, let's assume you want to use silicon. Um, if you can get stacks of silicon wafers covered in organic material into that cross section with roughly half a gram on, yes, we'd like to see a signal. Um, and silicon is not going to give you a great, much of a signal either. So it, it works in your favor. Yeah. Um, and, and we can go less than half a gram is proportional to counting time. So uh, it's, it's more that we need large samples. As, as I say, it, we do need a decent amount of material, a lot bigger than the, I think Andy uses nanoliters on uh, uh, the reflectometer. We need, we need bigger samples than that. Uh, we do need the sort of hundreds of milligrams uh, sample size, but if we can manage the sample in such a way that we can get it in our relatively big beam, yeah, we can still we should be able to measure it. We could we could conceivably do something. Right. I mean, that's a bit like the small angle neutron scattering on thin films, where you have to stack 
yep. all the, um, the, 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 the um, samples together. Yep. Okay. Now that's just, that's just helpful to sort of understand because, you know, you know, one of the limitations in that sense is how much material you need. Anyway, I'll, I'll pass it over to Ian because he's probably- Just, to, a, just to follow up with one other uh, thing is you, you mentioned uh, the orientational dependence. Uh, we do a lot of measurements on single crystals, so actually very well yeah. set up for, for for doing things which have very strong orientational dependence as well. So yeah, it's just a case of getting it in the beam. If you, if you can fit it in the yeah. beam, we can measure it. Right. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I'll, I'll jump in at this point. Um, I was really interested in the the elastic fixed window scans you were talking about mm -hmm. and being able to look at diffusion and some of the molecules you showed in that diagram were, were deuterated and some weren't. Yep. And I'm wondering, is, is selective deuteration um, needed in that case to try to work out what's doing what, or, or is it helpful? It is helpful. Well, if you, I, it's always the argument, if it's possible to uh, uh, do selective deuteration, you can basically silence the incoherent signal from one component. So you can do the classic thing where you've got a, two system uh, polymer to a mixture of some sort uh, where you have one sample deuterated, one sample hydrogenous, switch them around, do both hydrogenous, and you can understand where varying components come from. Um, it's not always essential. The other thing that, just going back to that, is I keep emphasizing there's a big difference in Q. Now, the size of this thing is very different to the size of this thing. Um, so they'd have very different Q dependence as well. So uh, deuterations one, that one's going to have virtually no signal. Uh, but this one with some hydrogen in it um, is uh, uh, going to have a different, it's got different size scale. Therefore, it's going to have a different signal and Q to uh, the other components. So deuteration would help because you can just deuterate these bits and turn it off. Um, but you don't have to do it or deuterate that bit in the, the case of that experiment. So yeah, it, right. it's it's a tool. It helps. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking a lot of a lot of the materials of interest um, for us are are in blend form. Yeah. So it's you know host guest um, systems, and so that must complicate the analysis somewhat. But there it are does. ways around that. Yeah, but the other thing, like with many host guest systems as well, um, the dynamics are different of the small molecule to the big molecule as well. So often you'll uh, have this thing that you'll see something on the pelican time scale uh, uh, of the light of the smaller molecule, but on the emu time scale, that's basically just annoying background, and the uh, larger molecule uh, moving around is what you're actually seeing. So you can use all of these things to uh, to understand the dynamics. Um, you know, you've got energy scale, length scale, and deuteration. You don't have to use all three of them. You can get away without it. And I appreciate, I appreciate deuterations in complete pain a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. But I see that Andy hasn't, um, Andrew Nelson hasn't avoided um, putting up a plug. So thank you, Andrew, for the NDF. <laughs> the NDF is a great facility. And yes. Very valuable. Yeah, I think that's very, uh, I've worked elsewhere and uh, it's the only place I've worked with a deuteration facility on site. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thanks, Ian. Were there any other questions? Uh, please jump in quickly if you did have any other questions. Yeah, I have a uh, question, Richard. Is there any overlap between um, the kinds of information that you get from inelastic scattering and um, <coughs> with uh, measurements that could be done at a synchrotron, say, down in Melbourne? Um, well, obviously, if you go to the IR beam line, you're measuring it part of the range that we can measure with vibrational spectroscopy. Um, there's not... You know, lots of, the, lots of our users in general use things like the uh, XSAF beam line, um, but the, the, they're probing slightly different things. Um, so it, it's not like with you know, powder diffraction where X-ray and neutron powder diffraction or small angle scattering where SACs and uh, uh, SANs are directly comparable, but you're looking at 
you look at the same thing just with different scattering cross sections. Um, uh, there's no analogous technique in that sense, in that regard. But lots of people do obviously study local structure using things like XFs and, um, and dynamics using FIR. So uh, yes and no. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, um, thank you very much, Richard, uh, for your presentation. Well, thank you for inviting me again. Was, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, it's very good to uh, to have a, a, a talk like this, I guess, kind of, uh, you know, learning a bit about the equipment that is available to our community. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we'll we'll leave it there, everyone. Uh, we'll be back again uh, next month. So first Wednesday of the month is our typical um, schedule. I'd like to remind everyone that if you have uh, interest in giving a talk, then please feel free to send through an abstract to me. Or if you have a PhD student who needs to give a seminar as part of their PhD candidature or who has just given a seminar uh, and you think that they would be a good um, candidate for speaking in this format, then please also um, send those details through. Um, so thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Richard.